Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Bobby. I'm an alcoholic. My sobriety date is June 2nd, 1988. <laughs> My home group is the McKean Street Miracle Group of Alcoholics Anonymous. We meet at St. Agnes Hospital, brought in McKean Street, South Philadelphia, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday at 7 o'clock. If you're ever in the neighborhood, please stop by. We'd love to have you. We'll go out for cheesesteaks afterwards. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, that, uh, I'd like to thank the committee for asking me to come down here. Uh, I've always seen the flyers. I haven't been down here uh, before, but uh, you had uh, my friend uh, Robbie from Jersey came down here last year. Uh, Robbie's a very quiet guy for those who don't meet him. <laughs> and, but he told me that you guys treat him like gold, and you, and you guys have you've been very kind to me this weekend. Chapter, uh, chapter 5 tells me what my directions are. I will tell you in a general way what my life was like as an active alcoholic, what happened to me and what my life is like today as a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I was born and raised in a very blue-collar ethnic neighborhood. I had uh, seven brothers and sisters. My mother was pregnant for almost nine years. Sure, look, sure, sure. Really, I, I, I got my sister's 11 months older than me, and I am 11 months older than to my next sister. There's eight kids uh, in like a nine-and-a-half-year, almost ten-year span. Uh, we had no booze all in the, in the house. Uh, my father did not drink. My mother could not drink, uh, besides being pregnant all those years. Uh, she had a long history of mental illness and abuse prescription medication, so we had no booze at all in our house. My grandparents lived around the corner from us, and they had a bar in their basement, and that's where all the family functions were held, the christenings, the graduations, and things like that. And that's where I had my very first drink. I loved my grandparents. My grandparents were immigrants. Uh, they spoke kind of funny, but... Uh, some people think everyone in my neighborhood speaks kind of fun. <laughs> but it, it was great, though, because my parents came from pretty big families. Uh, my mother is uh, one of eight, and my father is one of nine. So there was always aunts and uncles and cousins, and, and we just loved the party. And, and I just loved that stuff, you know? My, my very first time I drank, I was just a kid. I did not get drunk, but I remember what it was. It was Ballantine beer. And I remember that because Ballantyne used to sponsor the Phillies. And I remember going up to Connie Mack Stadium with my father in the old school board in right center field. And what happened, I was in my grandparents' basement. I was running around the, the bar polishing off the half empties. Or the half fulls, I guess. It depends on your perception. <laughs> but as my uncles were pointing at me, he said, look at him. Look at Bobby. And that's what I craved because I never felt a part of. And that would be true even into recovery. I never felt a part of. And that's pretty tough to do when you got ten people living in a small three-bedroom row home, but I never felt a part of. And the need for me to be accepted outweighed anything else. My drinking really kind of took off in high school. Um, all the kids in my neighborhood went to the local diocesan high school, but my parents had sent me to a private Jesuit high school. And right away I felt kind of different because most of the kids who went to this school were from affluent families from the suburbs. It was just me and a couple of the dirt balls from the neighborhood, and we went there. <laughs> and we had a reputation because we used to walk to school, you know. And these kids would be getting dropped off in school by their parents in their luxury automobiles, and me and the guys from the neighborhood were inside robbing their lockers. <laughs> and, and I knew that was wrong. You know what? But, you know, one of my nicknames was Crazy Coil. And I would do things in my gut that I knew was wrong by the values instilled in me by my folks and by the nuns and everyone else. But, you know, those values and uh, ethics went out the window because the need for me to be accepted by you outweighed anything else. So I was your entertainment committee, and I did things in my gut that I knew was wrong, but I did it anyway. I remember my freshman year at the prep. It's September. It's football season. Uh, you know, there was a, a, a away game, football game, and a away game. We rented a bus. There was drinking. There was fighting. There was police activity. It was great. <laughs> it was a blast. And I remember we all had to go sit at this plenary the first day back to school. And he had about ten of us lined up outside his office. And they were all upperclassmen except me and another kid from the neighborhood. We're the only two freshmen. And he came right down to us, you know. He said, what's with you guys? You guys in the jack getting this jackpot? You're already here like two weeks. And I just shrugged my shoulders and said, you know, Father, it's just one of them things. And what it was, it didn't take me long to size up situations, you know. I was there quickly, you know. I knew who, uh, even though I did well academically, I didn't hang out with the AP kids. And, and I didn't play sports, so I didn't hang out with the, uh, the athletes. I was there a couple weeks, and I knew who the party guy was. 
And, and that would be the same when I went in the service. I, I always, it didn't take me long to find out who the guys were about the party and the insanity. And that's why I hung out with them. When it came time, to, you know, and, and at the prep, you know, I, I gave the bare minimum effort required to get by. And that would be the standard I would set for the next number of years. You know, mediocrity was my goal. I gave enough to keep the heat off my back. I didn't want any tension, either good nor negative. I, I didn't want anything at all. I just wanted to skate by, you know. And that's what I did. I gave the bare minimum effort required to get by. When it, when it came time to graduate from the prep, I really had no d- desire to further my education. And I knew that would uh, that cause some problems at home because we didn't have much. And my parents made a lot of sacrifices to send me and my brothers and sisters to private school. So I know I couldn't stay home because it would be hell to catch. And I couldn't get an apartment. I had no money, no skills, you know. My options were very limited. So what I did, I thought was a bright move. I enlisted in the service. That wasn't a bright move back then, though, because not many people were going. In fact, there were still guys living up, uh, you know, in Canada. But I enlisted, and I, I wound up getting sent overseas, and I spent 13 months overseas, and that's when my drinking really took off. Now, I never messed around with other substances, never, because I had a lot of good friends in my neighborhood who had gone over and got whacked on certain things. So I had a, I had a fear of other substances. But I definitely had a drinking problem before I went in. I was there a couple months, and several good friends of mine got killed, and I didn't know how to handle that, you know? Uh, so you, because in my, in my house, uh, we didn't talk about nothing. It was all surface stuff, and, you know, and I can identify with what Irene talked about earlier. You know, we didn't tell anybody nothing. And once you moved out of the house, once you were, like, went away to school or got married, you were no longer privy to the secrets of the family. Everything stayed within inside you, and if you lived in the house, everything stayed in, within the walls of the house, I mean, the family. And that's just the way it was. But uh, So I couldn't tell anybody how this affected me, but you know what? Booze numbed the pain. And I did the same thing in the service, you know. I, I, I didn't, did not distinguish myself, but I didn't get in any jackpots either. I gave the bare minimum effort required to get by, you know. And when my tour was up, I came home, and I wound up taking a couple civil service exams, and then I enrolled in school. I went to St. Joe's. And um, the same thing there, you know. And... Uh, you know, it's it's funny because at the end of the semester, it was about this time of year, it was May, it was the end of the semester, and uh, one of my friends called me up, he said, Bobby, the Phillies are playing tomorrow afternoon, it's one of those businessman specials, you know, like one of those like Tuesday 12 o'clock games, they said, you want to go? I said, sure, because they wasn't going to miss me in the classroom because I wasn't participating there, so me and four other guys from the neighborhood, they had since moved, they're playing at the vet in South Philadelphia. And it was an unusually warm day, and I'm up at the 700 level drinking that cheap watered-down beer. And I told one of the guys I was with, I said, you know what, I'm going to run down to the field and meet one of the players. <laughs> and they kind of shrugged me off because another nickname I had was Bullshit Bob. I said, like, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I did that. I didn't do nothing. I just drank and made stories up. That's what I did. I never got off the bar stool, you know. So what I did this day, I, I worked my way down to the old picnic area they had, and I jumped over the fence, and I ran out, and I was running around uh, the outfield, and the San Diego Padres were in town. And Dave Winfield was the right fielder for the Padres. And I went out and I shook his hand. I said, hi, Dave, how you doing? <laughs> and he looked at me. He said, brother, he said, what are you doing out here? And from behind him, I saw the guards come. And I said, Dave, I got to go now. <laughs> so I, start, I started running towards the infield. And I went to slide into second base. And as I was running towards the infield, there was more guards coming from the third base side. And I knew I couldn't do that because if I slid into the base, I'd get caught. So I turned around and I started walking towards first base. And I'm as close as, uh, I don't know, about six, seven feet away from the guard, right? I'm walking like to give myself up. At the last second, I dig the guy and I ran out in the airfield. <laughs> now, it seems like I'm running around like a lunatic for about ten minutes, but it's probably closer, maybe three or four, right? Up on the scoreboard, they put Mr. Excitement. Like, they couldn't catch me. <laughs> but all of a sudden, I got nowhere to go. Now, at this point, I'm out of breath. I'm, about, I'm drunk. I'm about to get sick. The fence is 12 feet high, like I'm cornered. I just stopped running. I waited to just, I just stopped. And there was a lot of guards at this time. And, and they escorted me off the field, and I got a standing ovation from 37,000 people. Because as they was taking me up through the bullpen in right field, Tug McGraw was in the bullpen, and he gave me the thumbs up. So, uh, now, I knew I was going to get a beating from these guards because I made them look so stupid, you know? That was okay. They could have beat on me all day long because I knew that I would be a legend off this. I could drink for free the next week off the story. 
Now, you, 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 you heard the old, uh, you know, Mark Twain had the saying, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. But uh, I swear to God, this is a true story. But not only that, I had those four guys from the neighborhood. See, this would be a type of story that I would make up. But I had them four guys from the neighborhood up on the 700 level. They were going to be my witnesses. I was in. I knew that. Just as I was about to get my beat and the Philadelphia police lieutenant showed up, he said, what's the matter with you? He said, are you drunk? Are you high? I said, no, I'm just happy. I'm just happy to be here. <laughs> he said, what are you going to get your happy ass out of the stadium? <laughs> so not only did he save me from getting a beaten, but more importantly, he saved me from getting arrested. And that was important because one of them civil service exams I took kind of panned out and I got hired by the Philadelphia Police Department. <laughs> <laughs> they was hiring anybody back then. <laughs> Our mayor at the time was a guy by the name of Frank Rizzo. He's a former cop. And Frank, you get bank on Frank. <laughs> there was 8,300 of us, and we were nothing but uh, uh, a gang with badges, you know. Uh, I wasn't even old enough to drink. The drinking age in Pennsylvania has always been 21. At that time, the drinking age in Jersey was 18. And where I lived in Philly, I could be across the bridge quicker than I could be other parts of Philadelphia. So we used to go over the bridge all the time and drink. Once I got on the job, though, I can go wherever I want, you know. I remember when he swore us in, you know, he, we were holding up our badges. And he said, gentlemen, you're holding the tickets to the best show in town. And he was right, you know. So uh, I, I spent my first 10 years in North Philadelphia. And I would see the ravages of alcoholism and drug addiction day in, day out. And at the end of the day, I would go out with guys in the squad and I would drink, you know. I saw a lot of things on the job that bothered me, but I couldn't tell my coworkers that because I wanted to be part of one of the boys. And most of these guys, they were all older guys than me. You know, they, they did a big hiring at the end of the 70s. A lot of these guys were all Vietnam vets. And I wanted to be accepted by these guys, you know, to the point where I even engaged in behaviors. I knew my gut was wrong, but I did it in any way because I needed to be accepted by these guys that way anything else. And you know what? Uh, the drinking got ugly for me quickly. That story I talk about running on the field, I tell that story for a couple of different reasons. One, it's true. Secondly, it's the only funny story I got. <laughs> See, I wasn't a funny guy, you know. I wasn't a lover. I wasn't an athlete. I was none of that stuff. I was a lying, thieving, stinking, falling down, violent drunk. And if I hung around you, you had something I wanted. I used and abused every person I came in contact with. And thirdly, I was, I was a major blackout drinker from the very first start. You know, just drinking beer and, and occasionally other things, but mostly beer. But I was a blackout drinker, and I would remember I would come on to the corner the next day, and the guys would tell me the things I did before, the night before. And then two or three hours later, when we'd be out, I would be repeating these stories like I remembered them, and I didn't, you know. So uh, the drinking got ugly for me. And you know what? I was the last guy to figure it out. I remember, I told, my very first meeting in Alcoholics Anonymous was in 1979. And I don't tell people I went out because I really never came in. But I'll tell you what happened. I was at work one day, and our job, we had a, a – I, I showed up at work, and one of my coworkers was drunk. And on our job, our job, we had a counseling unit, an EAP unit. And part of that EAP unit, they had a, a, a group uh, called the 369. And I remember I showed up at work, and the supervisor said, Bobby, take this guy up to the, uh, the, the unit. He's detailed there for the day. Now, 369 was a little house that sat in a park. And I come in down the driveway, and there was a guy sitting on the porch, Eddie, Eddie M. And I pulled up. I said, Eddie, I'm dropping this guy off. I'll be back at 4 o'clock to pick him up. He looked me dead in the eye. I said, kid, do you want to come in? I said, no, I don't. I was insulted that he even asked me. Because I know what alcoholics were. Alcoholics were these poor people I was dealing in with day in, day out. You know, uh, alcoholics, were you older guys? Or you marry guys? Or you guys with the three heads? I didn't have a problem drinking. I was a beer drinker, and there was no way you could be an alcoholic drinking beer. I mean, the only time I drank hard liquor was like on St. Patty's Day, or New Year's Day, or payday. But I was a beer drinker. <laughs> and you couldn't, be a, you couldn't be an alcoholic drinking beer. You know, when I got sober a few years later, Eddie was one of the first guys I saw in my first outside meeting, and he just smiled. He said, so, kid, you finally came around. You know what? I was at a family function one time, and my uncle, he was a boss on the job, and he pulled me off to the side. He said, Bobby, I'm hearing stories about you. You're going to get yourself in a jackpot. You better take it easy. I was at work one day, and a supervisor pulled me off to the side. He said, you know what, kid? He said, you're smart. You're going to go places, but that booze is going to mess you up in one ear and out the other. Several years later, on two separate occasions, I ran into my uncle and that supervisor in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I realized at that point that they were trying to 12-step me. And I remember talking to my uncle. I said, Jimmy, how come you didn't tell me? He just smiled. He said, Bobby, you just weren't ready yet. 
which just goes to show you that all the drinking and all the other behavior I engaged in were necessary for me to hit my bottom, you know? I was 24 years old, and I shot and killed a kid, in, uh, a 15-year-old kid in the line of work. And it, it was a terrible situation that couldn't be avoided, you know? Uh, they now have a phrase, uh, you know, a term suicide by police, but that wasn't coined back then. And I use that as an excuse to crawl on the bottle, and that's what I did for the next three years. I wound up getting sober when I was 27. A lot of people offered help to me, and I rejected that, and I was just full of self-pity. And uh, I just crawled in the bottle. My drinking took me to a lot of my nevers, and one of those nevers was the use of other substances. I wound up getting promoted, and I got transferred in this unit, and I was, my, I was drinking, my judgment was impaired, and I was put in a position where I thought I needed to get involved in other substances. Uh, my drug use is very short. It lasted 17 months. It caused a lot of problems, and it brought me to my knees. And I think out of respect to the fifth tradition, that's why I need to talk about that stuff, you know. That's where it went. I was sitting home from work one day, and I was sitting there reading the Daily News, and there was an article in the bottom of the paper. It said alcohol problems, drug problems, marital problems, suicide, you know. You know and uh, marital problems, thoughts of suicide, depression. And I'm looking at the ad, and I'm four out of five because I'm single. <laughs> and I'm sure, I'm sure if I was married, I'd been batting a thousand. And, but they talk about the moment of clarity, but as soon as it came, it quickly left. But something made me cut that ad out, and I stuck it in my wallet, and I continued on drinking. It was Memorial Day weekend, 1988, and I was uh, guys in my squad were in this uh, bar, were drinking, pounding them away, and uh, one of my coworkers decided that he, he needed to leave for one reason or the other, and I decided I would give him a ride home, designated driver. Another term that wasn't phrased yet, and you'll see why. Uh, I've always been a show-off, always an arrogant guy. I was very aggressive in my job, and I got a lot of publicity, and just in case you happen to miss it, I would have an article to show you to, uh, to verify that. So I decided I was going to show off my driving skills, and that's pretty easy to do when, when it's not your car, you know. I just, city vehicles, it wasn't unusual for me to go down sidewalks and do all that other stuff. And I was going to impress my coworker with these skills that I had. And uh, I was riding out the street, and there was a, guy, a kid riding towards me on a bicycle. He was about a couple blocks away when I decided I was going to play chicken with this kid. Unfortunately, at the last second, we both turned in the same direction. I ran this kid over. As he lied bleeding on the, the hood of my car, I got out of my car with my nightstick and was going to beat this kid because I thought he was milking me for an insurance claim. The guy that I was with prevented me from doing that, so I took this kid and threw him off to the side of the street like a piece of trash. I pulled this crumpled bicycle from beneath my car, threw that off to the side of the street like a piece of trash. I went back to the bar, I made some sort of smart remark, and I continued on drinking. When I came to the next day, I realized I was in serious, serious trouble, but I didn't think anybody would help me because I was such a creep. And, you know, I couldn't even get people to hang out with me, you know. I remember I would call people up, and they would make, oh, no, I got to work, I got to do this, I'm broke. I said, that's okay, I got you covered. They said, no, thank you. It's pretty tough when you can't even buy people towards the end of your drink. And, and I, it, it, I was just an ugly person. I had been for some time. You know, I remember, and I tried to stop drinking, you know. I remember at work, I was, like, a kind of abusing my sick time and vacation time. And, you know, the boss came up to me and said, you know what, you're going to get yourself jammed up. You know, and I would go on the wagon for a bit and, you know, out on another run. I'd be living with a girl at the time, and she said, you know what, Bobby, you're a pretty nice guy, but when you start drinking, you become a pig and an animal, you know. And I would try to save that, you know, and I'd go on a run again. You know, i try to give it up for Lent. i try to do all these other things, you know. I was just never successful. I didn't know what to do the next day. So what I did do, I got a bottle of liquor, a case of beer, and some other substances, and checked into a hotel with the intentions to consume all this stuff to build up the courage for me to end my life. And at this point, I was suspended from my job. I had no longer access to my weapon, so I couldn't shoot myself. So three days later, they're knocking on the hotel door to kick me out. And I know what to do. So I walked over to the window, and I opened up the window, and I was going to jump out the window. And when I opened up the window, I was on the fifth floor of the hotel, and I remembered I was scared of heights. <laughs> <laughs> I made 23 jumps and never overcame my fear of heights, you know. So I went in the bedroom and I filled the bathtub with water and I had a blow dryer and I was going to pull the blow dryer into the tub to make it appear an accidental electrocution. But every time I would pull the blow dryer into the tub, it would come unplugged. <laughs> I was about a foot and a half short on cord. And it was a scene like out of that Woody Allen movie where he tried to kill himself, but he just couldn't do it. And that's okay. I, you know, I laughed, but, you know, I never want to forget the pain I was in that day. 
because it, would, it turned out to be the last day I, dr- I would drink, and, but I, I didn't know that then. So the only only tool that I had left was my car. So I took one last spin from my neighborhood. I started up the Falls Bridge, and I come down the East River Drive, and I was going to end my life in an automobile accident. Now, for those who don't know, the East River Drive is a winding road along the uh, Schuylkill River, and I come and dri- coming down the drive towards the art museum, and I decided I would end my life in an automobile accident. I was just going to oncoming traffic. And I handled enough of these jobs, and I knew that would definitely do the trick. And, and it was a weekday. It was like a Wednesday or Thursday morning, about 10 o'clock in the morning, and that would be important because at any other time, I would have probably succeeded. You know, because like the, the, like it's a winding road, and it's usually heavy traveled, and this is a work day. A lot of people at work. And the speed limit, I think, is 25, and I'm doing about 40, and I'm cooked, and I'm hungover, and I'm crying, and I'm flying down the drive. And I now know my higher power is looking out after me, but I didn't know that then. And the attention to going to oncoming traffic, something hit me, you know. I didn't want to go to oncoming traffic. For the, the only reason was I didn't want to hurt anybody else. You know, like I said, I hurt everybody I came in contact with, and those closest to me the most got hurt the most. So I decided I would wrap myself around a tree, and I handled enough of these jobs. I know they had these big old trees, and that that could definitely do the trick, too. And as I continued down the drive, I'm approaching Boathouse Row. I just started crying, and I pulled over at the end of the drive, and it's Boathouse Row. And I pulled over, and I sat behind the wheel of my car, and I cried like a baby for about 10 minutes. And I reached into my glove box, and in the glove box was my wallet, and inside the wallet was that ad that I clipped out of Daily News about six weeks before. And it's no longer there, but at the end of that, uh, uh, the last boathouse is one of those old glass and closed phone booths, and I went in the phone uh, booth, and I dialed up that phone number on that ad. And the woman who answered the phone, I spoke to this woman like I spoke to no one in my life before. I told her the truth. And you know what? Once I started uh, talking to her, I couldn't stop, and I was just pouring out everything in my life. You know, my life is a shambles. You know, my career is in jeopardy, and all this stuff's going on. And God bless her. She just listened patiently. And she said, listen, she said, uh, why don't you drive over to Hahnemann Hospital? Somebody be waiting to talk to you. I said, okay. So I got my car, drove over to Hahnemann. It was only about a five-minute ride. They were waiting for me. They admitted me to their 10 footer psychiatric unit. And they kept me there a couple of days. They got me kind of stabilized. And from there, I got transferred to the VA hospital out in West Philadelphia. And I spent a couple of weeks in their flight deck. And from there, I got transferred to the VA hospital out in Coatesville. And I spent a couple of weeks in their flight deck before they put me on an alcohol and drug board. When I pulled over that day and made that phone call, Alcohol Synonymous was the furthest thing from my mind. I did not think that I had a problem with alcohol. I thought it was my short use of other substances. If I could leave that crap alone, I'd be okay. Maybe I got this mental illness and I heard this from my mother. Maybe I got this stress stuff they're now talking about. I got this from the experience in the service or I got this experience from my job. Maybe it's the neighborhood I live in. Maybe it's the fact that I'm a mummer. It's all these things, but it can't be. <laughs> but it couldn't be alcohol because I'm a beer drinker and there's no way you could be an alcohol drinking beer. So I remember my first day in the alcohol and drug ward at the VA hospital. I'm there probably uh, about two hours. I'm wandering around getting a lay of land. And I walk into the day room, and up on the day room uh, wall, they had the large window shade of the 12 steps and the 12 traditions. And as I zip through the steps, I got about six of them done. <laughs> you know, I, I see the part about the amends. I said, they're screwed, you know, out of sight, out of mind. But what happened that day, two men came up, and I would later find out that they were part of the treatment facility committee. I did not know that then. And they... They told their story. The moment that the speaker said something about his background that I didn't like, couldn't relate to, didn't identify with, I would immediately tune him out. I was too busy to listen to the messenger and not the message. Now I'm looking around the room and I'm eyeing up my peers. You know what? I'm not as bad as these guys. A lot of these guys had legal problems. I didn't have any legal problems. The fact that I had a gold shield in my back pocket probably had something to do with that. All these guys had marital problems. No one wanted to talk to them. Kids, wives, I I, I didn't have that problem probably due to the fact that I've never been married. I don't have any kids. You know, I was looking for the differences and not the similarities, and the cockiness settled in. But what bothered me the most was at the end of this meeting, everyone got in a circle and said the Lord's Prayer. If this is what you people are about, I don't want nothing to do with you, because I hated God. And I know the kind of strong words, but that's what it was. I hated God. And I'll tell you why. I was 15 years old. I came home from school one day. And I talked about my mom's mental illness. My mom was like a fundamentalist with the church, you know. And uh, she was in the charismatic movement, so she could speak in tongues. And there was TV and radio programs and pictures and candles and all that other stuff throughout the house. And I'm in my house, probably about 10, 15 minutes, and I, I come across my mother, and she had slit her wrist. And she, she, she looked up at me, and she said, Bobby, help me. I looked down, and I said, good for you. And I walked out of the house. And I got an older guy to get me uh, a bottle of wine from the state store. 
And I came home later that night. My father told me what happened. I acted surprised. So, yeah, how about that? So that happened when I was 15. I didn't get sober until 12 years later. I was 27. That's 12 years of hating God. It will be a couple more years before I would deal with this. So I broke away from the group and would not say the prayer. When it came time to get discharged in the VA hospital, a woman came up to me. And, you know, I'm, I'm pleased. I'm about to say this, and it's not to get a laugh. Uh, she was a saint. She, she had to be a member of al You know why? Because she saw all through my stuff. You know, I, it was just... It was just a facade, you know, to keep people at bay. She saw right through it. And she came up and she told me, she said, you know what, the only way you're going to make it is going to, you're going to need to go to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I need to tell you that's the best piece of advice I got. And that's where I would get my recovery in Alcoholics Anonymous. I did not get it at the VA hospital. I had the VA hospital help me, and they did tremendous work with a lot of issues I had going on. But I would get my recovery in AA. And I went to AA every single day, sometimes two or three times a day, depending on the shift I was working. And... Obviously, I would get there late, and sometimes I'd leave early. Uh, I don't drink coffee, so I don't make it. Never drank it in my life. I don't smoke cigarettes, and never, never smoked a cigarette in my life, so I don't empty any ashtrays. I don't take your phone numbers because most of your screwballs, I don't believe you anyway. <laughs> I remember my very first meeting. There was a husband and wife speaking. They had 10 years. The woman had one more day than her husband, and she constantly reminded him that throughout her talk. <laughs> And, you know, these people with 10 years, I didn't believe them. I thought, you know, maybe you could go over and drink in Jersey and keep your Pennsylvania time. Or... <laughs> you, you had these private parties going on where the real deal was going on because uh, I, just didn't, I just couldn't get with it. But the, one, the only reason I kept coming back, there was a guy from my neighborhood who I personally knew uh, who was a pretty rough dude in and out of jail, and he was sober for a while, and I knew he was, for, he was sober. And I knew this guy's background. I said, if he could stay sober, maybe there's something. And I kept coming back. But I didn't do anything else. But he was the only reason I kept coming back, because I didn't believe anybody else. And I was crazy as a bed bug, you know? I remember I volunteered to sit up chairs, me and this other guy who was just as sick as I was. And you know how alcoholics don't like change. So we, we, we decided we are going to sit the, uh, the chairs up at this meeting. And they, they're set up a particular way. And we came in on Tuesday night. We got there half hour early, and we, we uh, changed them facing another direction. <laughs> and the following Tuesday, we got there. We got about the half hour early, and we put them the other direction. <laughs> Week three, we turned them completely around. Like when you come into the meeting, it's usually the back of the room. But when you came into the meeting that night, you were facing the front of the room. <laughs> they cornered us after that meeting. <laughs> the old timers and they sent like these real big guys you know, and they if you can still set these chairs up next week but we want them set up a particular way and that's how nuts I was you know I made meetings but man that's all I did I just made meetings and I was crazy as a bed bug I was sitting in this bar because they sold real good roast beef right <laughs> and I'm drinking seltzer out of a rock glass and I, that's the truth I mean 16 years and that's why I said I was there because I, they sold real good roast beef but the deal was the really reason I was there because again I'm, I'm an arrogant guy and towards the end of my drinking especially uh, you know a lot of things going on I was getting a lot of negative publicity and I wanted people don't believe the hype I'm back things were good and this is happening that's why I was there I was a show off but a couple of guys came in and they, you know they were you know, breaking my stones wanted to knock me down a couple of pegs and I thought I had enough and I'm drinking like seltzer out of a rock glass, and I just stood up, and I punched this guy in the face with the glass, and I cut him severely. He bled like a pig. And the cops, the uniform guys who handled the job, they came in, and they knew me, and they cut me a break, and they let me go. And that's where I learned my lessons about people, places, and things. And I have since found a place that sells real good roast beef without being in that type of environment. I didn't need to be there. It's a hell of a lesson to learn, but, uh, you know, that's what it was. I was sober a year, and I told my story. My home group, you told your story uh, when it was your anniversary. and. Uh, it was an incredible experience. I got done speaking. It was thunderous applause. The blind could see. The lame walked. It was really incredible. <laughs> and people came up, and they patted me in the back and said, Bobby, you're doing so good. I lied during my entire story. <laughs> the fact that I identified myself as an alcoholic because of my home group at that time, you couldn't talk about anything else. I did not believe I was an alcoholic. In fact, but I was repeating everything you wanted to hear because I'm a pretty bright guy. I know what the deal was. So I can give all that stuff right back to you. In fact, during the course of my story, a bottle of beer appeared in my head, but you guys didn't want to hear that. You wanted to hear all the quotes, and I gave you everything you wanted to hear. And when you patted me in the back and said, Bobby, you're doing so good, I was dying inside. Man, I loved them old-timers. But I hated them, you know? And uh, 
Because they would like invite me afterwards to go out. And I would say no. But then when they wouldn't invite me out, I would get mad at them because they didn't invite me out. <laughs> but whenever they invited me, I would say no. I was just nuts. I swear to God. I'm not proud of this. You know, God is my judge. My home group, we had a court board. First name, last initial, day of the month, and how many years you're celebrating anniversaries in a month. I'm not proud of this, but you know, this is the truth. I, I'm, I'm big on time because seniority of time means a lot, right? If Joey A got three years and Bobby C got two years and Joey A went out, I said, good for him. I move up. <laughs> I, you know? I swear to God, I had no idea who John Barleycorn was. I was wondering why everybody is blowing this guy's anonymity. I said, he must be really tough SOB. I wouldn't want to tangle with him. When I found out who John Barleycorn was, I felt so stupid. Well, here I was. I was so damn bright. It damn near killed me. You know? <laughs> My early recovery, my first couple of years, I used to go to like go-go bars, right? I drank soda, right? So, and, and I would get my pictures taken, like with the entertainers, and, and I would come to meetings and pass them around to the old timers because I figured they would like that. <laughs> <laughs> they would look at the picture and they would look at me and they would shake their head, and I said, "Please, kid, please keep coming back." <laughs> and I thought they were being facetious. I said, "All right, I'll keep coming back." Despite, I was nuts. No one asked me to be their sponsor. No one wanted what the hell I had. <laughs> I didn't carry the message. I carried the, the disease. I swear to God. I go to meetings and get my hand up and share something. I go to the men's room or get something to drink. And people next to me, the seat next to me would be empty. They moved to the other side of the room. <laughs> then I try to glare them, stare them down. I was nuts. <laughs> I was 23 months sober and I beat another man with a baseball bat. I forget what step I was working that day. <laughs> I swear to God. You know, one day these guys came up to me, and you, know, and you know how you can trick new people. You ask them questions without giving them a chance to formulate the lie. They came up to me one day and say, Bobby, you working this weekend? And I knew I, what I should have said, but before I knew it, like, no came out off the tip of my tongue. I said, no, I'm not. They said, good, we're going on a retreat this weekend, and we're going to take you on a retreat with us. Now, see, I'm still not saying the prayer. And these guys, you know, these guys go to retreats a lot, and they're doing their deal. And uh, so, but... I couldn't tell these guys about my mom. You know, I mean, what would they think of me? But I really want to be liked by these guys. I want to hang out with these guys. But they kind of put me in the spot. So we're going to the, we're going up to the retreat. It's funny. Uh, usually at work, I drive the cars and my people, prisoners, are in the back seat. Here I am. I'm in the back seat with a guy on each side of me. It's like role reversal. I guess they're afraid I'm going to jump out. As we get closer to the retreat house, the knot in my stomach gets bigger. But I still can't tell these guys the deal. But the need for me to be accepted by these guys outweighs anything else. So I'm willing to put myself in this terrible situation, you know? I, we get at the retreat a house. I'm there about 15 minutes when I run across the retreat master. He gave me a big old smile. He's my disciplinarian from high school. <laughs> but not only that, he was a longtime member of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> And, man, he was so happy. I still remember, man, his face lit up, and he hugged me. And he said, it's great to see you. We start talking. He wants to know how long I'm sober. I'm telling him. He said, good. Where are you going to meetings? I'm telling him. He said, good. He said, who's your sponsor? I said, I ain't got one. So I'm a pretty bright guy, and he knew that. He knew I was a bright guy. He said, I strongly suggest you get a sponsor. And I said, okay. So I asked my roommate to be my sponsor. God forbid, should I ever be questioned again. Bobby, you got a sponsor? Yeah, there he goes right there. There's my sponsor. <laughs> And I never talked to the sponsor. The only time I talked to him is when I accidentally bumped to him in the meetings. And he would say to me, Bobby, I still got that same phone number. I said, yeah, yeah, I'll give you a call. I never called him. Nobody used to do. I said, you won't believe this guy. He got me doing this. He got me doing that. He did that. He didn't do nothing. I made it up. He put the hand of AA out there. I slapped it away. Then I character assassinated him the boot. I was just nuts. I swear to God. My second anniversary come, I didn't celebrate it. One month afterwards, I went to eat my gun. The same pathetic feeling I had 25 months before, but 25 months before, I'm loaded with drugs and alcohol. Here I am, stone cold sober, in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I went to eat my gun. Safe to assume my life is unmanageable. <laughs> I'm at a meeting one night, and that guy, Troubles. No one called him, uh, the guy from my neighborhood, no one called him Troubles to his face, because he was a pretty rough guy. But I saw him, and I knew he was for real, because it wasn't in the rooms of AA, it was out in the neighborhood, you know, where I saw him walking the walk. And I went up to him one day after a meeting, 25 months sober. I said, Bobby, I said, I need some help. I said, would you help me? Would you be my sponsor? He looked at me. He said, Bobby, I need to tell you. I've been watching these past couple of years. And I'm sticking my chest out. I said, yeah, he likes me. 
And I need to tell you, he said, you're full of shit. <laughs> That's not the response I'm looking for. <laughs> he said, I'm going to be your sponsor under certain conditions. A, you're going to call me every single day. You're going to go to a big book meeting a week. You're going to go to a step meeting a week. You're going to go to a men's meeting a week. You're going to leave them damn women alone, and you're going to get yourself a coffee commitment. And I'm saying to myself, who's he talking to? I'm 25 months sober. I'm selling the grapevines. I got it going on here. But what I did do, I looked them dead in the eye. I said, okay, I'm going to do that. And that's the night that I took the first three steps. Like I said, I wanted to eat my gun, you know, and it's safe to assume my life was unmanageable. And I knew that I was powerless over alcohol. Like I said, I hated everybody. But you know who I hated the most? I hated the new guys because they were getting better before me. Because I'm big about time, you know. I'm sober a little over two years, and I see this kid got a year, and he got this glow about him. The reason he got the glow was he was taking the steps. He was taking the action. I wasn't taking the action. And I hated everybody, but I hated these guys. So I knew as much as I hated God, and the resentment was still there. I hated God, but I knew God was working because these guys I hated the most, these new guys, I saw them come in, and they were in terrible shape. And I saw them get better before my eyes. So I knew something was happening. And I needed to latch on to that, and I needed to sort my crap out between religion and understand this was spiritual, but I just couldn't do it. You know, I could intellectualize it, but I wasn't about to brace it, and, and it caused me a lot of problems. But uh, my sponsor said, Bobby, are you, are you just willing to believe? Are you just willing? And I said, I am. He said, good. And then we got together on our knees, and we said the third step prayer. And then he got up after the prayer, and he told me, he said, Bobby, there's a difference between making a decision and making a commitment. And what we do now is we start writing an inventory. I said, whoa. Easy does it. <laughs> don't want to get well too soon. <laughs> and all these other slogans. I don't want to do one of these. I'm going to meetings and people talking about inventories. Oh, don't be doing one of them. And you're stirring so I Now you drink, you know, you're going to go out. I was about to eat my gun. You can't get no further out than that. What did I have to lose? I did my inventory very reluctantly. And you know what? It wasn't that bad. Everything I wrote down, I did. No big deal. The big deal was the next one, talking to him about it. But I'm a bright guy. I got to figure it out. I called him up. I said, Bobby, I want to go and retreat this weekend. I'm going to do my fist step with a priest. He said, Bobby, that's great. When you get done, stop by my house. You do it with me. <laughs> and you know how sponsors can be on the phone sometimes. Like, like you know... Like, telepath, like, don't you get it? And he must have picked up on it, too. He said, Bobby, I heard you. He said, did you hear me? And he went on to say, he said, my job is your sponsor. This is journey. I'm supposed to walk you through these steps. If I'm going to help you change, I think I need to know what we need to change. Now, the real deal is, even though I got God in the church on my resentment list, when I, went to do, when I wanted to do this fifth step with the priest, it wasn't to be spiritually enlightened. There were a lot of things in my inventory that I was embarrassed about. But I just knew in my training as a kid, whatever I said to the priest would stay between me and the priest. I was afraid to go to my sponsor because of the things I've done, that he would ridicule me, he would pass judgment on me, or even worse, he would tell other people what I did. And, if that, and that's what I thought, which just goes to show you that fearless wasn't quite complete. So what I did, I did that fifth step with that, uh, my sponsor. I never did it with the priest. And those things turned out to be unfounded fears. He didn't laugh at me, didn't ridicule me at all. Uh, didn't pass judgment on me and to the best of my knowledge he never told anybody else in fact you know what he did he shared some of his stuff with me which took away the terminal uniqueness that I was the only person in the world that has done certain things and I'll be forever grateful for him for doing that you know at the end of the fifth step he made me sit in his house he had a quiet room set up in his house I guess he didn't trust me that I would get sidetracked once I left his house and I sat quietly for that hour and I can only talk about my experience and you know what uh no bushes uh, on fire, lightning bolts and all that. But you know what it was? The screaming inside stopped. Now, that may not sound like a lot, but at this point, I'm probably, you know, maybe uh, 34, 35 months sober. For me, it's a credible experience because my head was always racing and the voices inside stopped, you know. Six and seven character defects. I didn't know what these were. I knew when I drank, I was a character. <laughs> I found out when I did my inventory that I had no character whatsoever. You couldn't trust me. I was not trustworthy. I was uh, unreliable. I was a rotten son, brother, you know, uncle, uh, co worker. I, I was nothing. Selfish and self-centered to the extreme, you know. In the sixth step, I became willing. And the seventh step was a prayer. But my sponsor told me, he said, Bobby, you need to put legs on those prayers, you know. 
And I, you know, I got a laundry list of character defects, and I can pray all day. God, help me, help me, like for patience. God, help me be patient. Help me be patient. But as I drive home tomorrow, as I'm traveling north on 95, should somebody cut me out, and I chase him five miles, giving him the finger, <laughs> that prayer for patience goes out the window. <laughs> he told me that God would do for me what I couldn't do for myself, but it is a program of action, you know. You know, and uh, the A step because of. I didn't burn my fourth step when I did step five. Most of my eighth step was done. Now, I was one of these guys before. So, whoa, I didn't harm anybody but myself. Right there should have been the tip off. I never did my inventory because when I did my inventory, like I said, I harmed everybody. But those closest to me, I harmed the most. The ninth step, direct amends. No phone calls, no letters from me because I didn't beat you with a bat over the phone or through the mail. You know. And when I want to take those other measures, you know, I could tell you lots of reasons. But the deal is it's probably fear. I'm afraid of the outcome. My sponsor said, direct amends, Bobby, not indirect. And I'd like to share two experiences on the ninth step. I was in a meeting, I guess, about, uh, it was about 14 years ago in North Philadelphia, and there was a guy who I saw come down the steps. I have not seen this guy since 1977. He is not on my fear, he's not on my men's list, not for any other reason, but I just plain forgot, you know, out of sight, out of mind. And they say more will be revealed. But as soon as he came down the steps, I recognized him. I know him right away. And what I used to do, I remember in a bar, he and I had words one day, and he would not react. So from that point on, whenever I wanted to impress anybody how tough I was or how nuts I was, I would publicly humiliate this guy. You know, the verbal uh, taunts, you know. Uh, one day I slapped him, and one day I spit on him. I mean, what worse thing can you do to another human being, the utter dedication, you know? And uh, I'm not a tough guy, I never was, you know. But I saw this guy right away, now, but he didn't recognize me. You know, I guess they say sober up, we clean up, right? So he comes, and he's sitting at the front table, and I, I'm, I'm just floored that I see this guy. And I'm looking at him, and he's looking at me like, like why is this guy looking at me? And I, get, I stand up, I get introduced, I look this guy dead in the eye. I said, my name is Bobby Coyle, and I'm an alcoholic. Now, I need to tell you why I use my full name. I love the traditions. I know they're top secret stuff. <laughs> we won't even mention concepts, but, you know, these traditions, a lot of them were misunderstood, and no more so than this 11th tradition, you know? All of a sudden, we get sober. It's like we join the mafia, right? <laughs> we, we take on nicknames. You know, there's Bucktooth Mary and Frank the Fox. <laughs> Frank the Fox, Mike the Monk, Pepsi George. I mean, you get all these nicknames, you know? All of a sudden, I don't want no one in my neighborhood I'm a drunk. I'm, I'm in AA. But everyone in my neighborhood knows I'm a drunk because there's little telltale signs. They come outside, they catch me, I'm urinating on their car. <laughs> you know, my girlfriend threw the clothes out the window. I'm slumped behind the wheel of my car, sprawled out. Everybody knows I'm a raving lunatic drunk, but God forbid my reputation should be tarnished by going to AA. <laughs> you know? The 11th tradition is real clear. Personal anonymity at the level of press, radio, and film. That means you will never see my full face or my full name, which is Robert Ignatius Benedict Coyle III, <laughs> stating, I am a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's the 11th tradition. Dr. Bob went on to say, in, in Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers, I was always told, cite the source. Dr. Bob said, when one drunk is anonymous from another drunk, that is a violation of the 11th tradition. He went on to say that anonymity is spiritually inspired and secrecy is fear inspired. However, I have no right whatsoever to break anybody else's anonymity. I was very involved in service back home, and we use our full names, and that's what we choose to do, but I have no right, whether you agree with me or not, I have no right to break your anonymity. So that's just a personal decision. I use my full name. So because, God forbid, 3 o'clock in the morning, you feel like drinking, what are you going to do, call information? Yeah, I'd like to have Bucktooth Mary's phone number. <laughs> no. Or you want to go visit one of these old-timers in the hospital. I'm here to see Frank the Fox. <laughs> Yeah, out of, you're out of luck, you know. <laughs> so, off that soapbox, back to my story. I looked this guy dead in the eyes. I mean, my name's Bobby Coyle. I'm an alcoholic. And he looked at me. He smiled. He, re he remembered. And when I got done speaking, like I said, making amends is much more than saying I'm sorry. Because for me, there was two words that meant squat. It's about righting the wrong. And I looked this guy dead in the eye, and I told the group what I did. And that wasn't the grandstand. I thought if I publicly humiliate him, the least I could do is make amends to him publicly. And I told the group what I used to do to him. And I looked him in the eye. Also, uh, I looked him dead in the eye and said, "Bob, uh, I'm truly sorry. And as long as I stay sober, I hope I never treat another human being the way I treated you." You know what? He came up and he hugged me. 
It's an incredible experience. Now, at the end of the meeting, we start talking. I said, Bob, what's going on? I ain't seen you in years, and how you doing? How you doing? He said, hey, Bobby, he said, I'm sober three years, and Alcoholics Anonymous. Now the arrogance kicks in, because I'm very involved in service back home, and I figured everybody knows who I am, but I ain't never seen this guy. Now, I need to tell you, I live in South Philadelphia. He lives in Roxboro, which is considered like Northwest Philadelphia. The meeting we're at is in North Philadelphia, and I'm talking to which is a meeting neither of us would either attend on our own. So I said, well, what brings you here tonight? He said, Bobby, I was flipping through the meeting directory tonight, and I was just looking for a different meeting, and for some reason, this meeting jumped out at me. Now, I need to tell you, we had 1,600 meetings a week. Our meeting directory is 70 pages thick, and he said this meeting jumped out at me. I am a firm believer that my God put that guy in my path, and I could do two things. I could do what I did then, or I could do what I did most of the time. See, the, the advantage of having eight siblings in a nine-year span is that there's always a close resemblance. So when people come up to me and say, hey, you're Bobby Cool, I say, no, no, you got me confused. You're talking about my brother Brian or my brother Sean, not me. <laughs> <laughs> Which I always did. I used to put the blame on them, you know. So uh, that's what I did. It was an incredible experience. Now, on the flip side of that, another example of a nice step. My home group was the Stepping Stones group of Philadelphia. And I was at a business meeting one day, and I made a motion for the betterment of AA. I know, because I made it. It had to be. <laughs> After discussion, the, moment doesn't even get, uh, the motion doesn't even get seconded. And I, uh, it's unbelievable. Because a friend of mine's there. And I grew up in a neighborhood. You know, we maybe had some warped rules, uh, you know. But uh, this is the deal. You always backed your boy. Right, wrong, or indifferent, you backed your boy. That's just the way it was. Another rule was, like, you can never date anybody's ex. Like, if you and I hung out together and you dated back in the third grade, I'm sorry I could never date you because you went out with Joe. <laughs> it's a crazy rule, but, uh, you know, it's a, it's a rule. So, but I could not believe that my boy Freddie did not second the motion. And, and I was mad at him, and I would never talk to him again. And I remember I was at work one day, and one of my coworkers who was also in the program, he came up to me, he said, Bobby, he said, Freddie Wheels is outside. He wanted to take care of some sort of business. I peeked out the window. I saw him. I said, you know what, tell him to take his fat ass down to City Hall. He cannot do that here. And then a few weeks later, that same co-worker called me up. He said, Bobby, he said, Freddie Wheels died last night. And he said, the reason I'm calling you is because he always spoke so highly of you. Now, here he was, a friend of mine, and as God is my judge, I cannot tell you what that motion was about. That's how petty it was. He was put in my path many, many times. And I chose not to make amends. You know, I would go into the room, and there would be four men there. I'd, be, I'd say hi to three of them and ignore him completely. And the moment my coworker said, Bobby, he always spoke so highly of you, I felt about yay big. And I've been praying for Freddie ever since, you know. So that's two experiences on the ninth step. See, the key word my sponsor pointed out to me in that ninth step is wherever possible. See, not whenever, because whenever denotes time, uh, denotes place, and wherever is time. No, whenever is time, wherever is place, and it's never the right time because I'm too busy, easy, doesn't it? You know? <laughs> so, the 10 step for me is nothing but 4 to 9 on a regular basis. Now, if I'm going to stand up and tell you I do a 10 step every day, that'd not be true. I'm pretty good with it. And I used to say, when I'm not doing a 10 step every day, no one knows but me. That's not true either. Because when I'm not practicing these principles, I operate in nitwit mode. <laughs> Should you cross my path in nitwit mode? You're also affected. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's amazing. You know, I, try, I, I laugh sometimes, you know, because I really am consistent with this. But you know what? Sometimes I try to kick back and stay sober in yesterday's sobriety, and it bites me in my backside every time. You know, and, and I laugh to myself. I so said, like, when are you ever going to figure this out? You know, I mean, you can't stay sober on yesterday's sobriety. I've been on some good loads. And sooner or later, I came too, you know. Uh, so you had to keep on drinking to maintain the load. The same thing on sobriety. I can't stay sober on yesterday's sobriety. The 11th step, it's uh, through prayer and meditation. I, I, and I do that, you know. I certainly don't want to tell you how I pray and meditate because I don't, I don't want to offend anybody, you know. Uh, up to this point, I've been giving you my experience. I'm about to give you my opinion, which I hardly ever do, but when I do, I qualify it. This is my opinion. I am so glad that Alcoholics Anonymous has given me the freedom to pray and meditate in such a way because if there was a particular way, I would not be here today. And I believe that that's one of the miracles of Alcoholics Anonymous. It, it gives that freedom. And I have tried many things throughout my years, and I'm comfortable doing what I do today. It's very special. I do it on a regular basis, and it works for me. So uh, to improve my conscious contact with God, it works, you know. The 12th step, having had a spiritual awakening, 
as the result of these steps, we try to carry this message. That's the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. I have been to thousands of meetings, and sometimes I hear some things like I look up the slogans and make sure I'm in an AA meeting. That's the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. But my sponsor tells me about that word, try. See, I went through my evangelical stage in recovery, you know, you know, and I wanted to run around and point, this is the way to do it, and this is the only way to do it. When I got done, I wanted to close the book and backhand you with it to make sure it sunk in. <laughs> you know, I remember I had an old-timer come up to me after a meeting one time. He said, you know what, kid? He said, you really got a nice message. He said, but you offend people the way you come off. He said, remember, it's not what you say, it's the way you say things. And you know what? He told me in such a loving way, I'm glad he did. Because if he told me any other way, I would have probably told him to go to hell. But, uh, but he came up and he told me in such a way. And you know what? It was important for me. And, you know, and I, I guess I've kind of mellowed out. It's one of the stages of growth, you know, uh, growing through recovery, you know. But the most important part of that 12 step is to practice these principles in all of our affairs. I'm only in an AA meeting an hour and a half a day. But what about the other 22 and a half hours? What about at the time on the job or the time in my neighborhood? Where for me, it's tough to stay sober, you know? For me, it's easy to stay sober. I've never seen anyone drink in the rooms of alcohol times. I've seen people under the influence, but I ain't never seen no one drink in an AA meeting, you know? It's easy for me to stay sober here, but out there where i got to practice these principles. That, that's, that's where it gets kind of tough, you know? And it's important, you know? And 12-step work takes many different forms and fashions, you know? I, I got involved in service, and I found about the traditions. Now, I love the traditions. Now, in early meetings, I didn't like the traditions. I thought there were rules, you know. And in my line of work, we don't like to follow the rules. We love to enforce them. They're for other people, but they're not for us. <laughs> but they're not rules. They're guidelines based on experience. And the steps are how it works, and the traditions are why it works. You know, the traditions are to the group, but the steps are to the individuals. And just the whole fascinating history about the traditions, I love that stuff. So I got involved in service. And I start learning about the traditions. And I got involved in service, and I start going to other meetings outside my neighborhood. And I remember the very first time I went outside my neighborhood, the first thought was, man, they're doing it wrong. <laughs> and I found out, you know, after it took me a while, a little while, a long while to figure it out, they weren't doing it wrong. The message was the same. The delivery may be different, you know. You know, some groups open up with a surrendered prayer and some, some close. Some do this, some do that. The message is the same. The delivery is different. And now I'm fascinated. I love when I do a lot of traveling. I love to see the way AA is in different areas. You know, I got involved in the service, and I was going to be the youngest delegate ever to the General Service Conference. Who that delegate was and how old they were from Area 59, I had no idea, but it was going to be me. <laughs> be careful, people with aspirations in service. You know, that's sick. I got involved in the service. I was on my way. Now, I need to tell you, I love service. I really do. And... Uh, I guess I'm going to give my opinion again real quick. I get uncomfortable when people say that service, you know, that's about, you know, uh, that's about power and politics. That has not been my experience. Some of the most selfless people that I have ex known have been through service, you know. I mean, there's a lot of times I would like to stay home and watch the Flyers. By the way, they won today. Yeah. <laughs> Smarty Jones, too. Smarty Jones. <laughs> It's a good day for Philly sports. <laughs> they build us up, they'll break our heart later. <laughs> so, hey, it goes to the neighborhood. <laughs> so, but uh, I, I love service, you know, and there are a lot of times I would like to lay up and watch a game or whatever. I remember my sponsor one time, about 12 years old, uh, Holmesburg was still open. He took me up. He said, Bobby, he said, we're going to go up to Holmesburg. And I, at, at first I said, no, nah, I'm not going. He said, you are. I said, I'm not. He said, you are. I said, okay. <laughs> because I didn't think I could go up there because I thought, like, you need it because of what I was doing for a living. I can't go up there. He said, Bobby, it isn't, they're not interested in that. They, they, it's a message of hope. That's what you carry. And I said, okay. Now, this was about a month before the commitment. And I remember as we get closer to the commitment, the commitment was on a Monday night. The Eagles were playing Monday night football. <laughs> they're playing the Cowboys. Oh. Oh, that's what I said, right? So I called my sponsor up. I said, you know, I'm trying to make some sort of excuse. He saw right through it. He said, Bobby, you gave me your word. It's a commitment. And by the way, if you pick up a, dr a drink, I don't think Randall Cunningham's going to come over and 12-step your ass. So you got to come. <laughs> so we went on the commitment. And we went up to Holmesburg. And it's a process to get, you know, buzzed in and all this other stuff, right? We get there. No one shows up. <laughs> They're all on the block watching the game. <laughs> Now I really got an attitude. <laughs> As I'm leaving Holmesburg, now Holmesburg's the county jail, I say to one of the CEOs, I guess all oh, your drunks must be up at uh, Greatersford, right? At the state correctional facility. And he didn't know what the hell I was talking about. And I'm driving home, and my sponsor, uh, 
he, he picks up on my uh, attitude. He says, Bobby, you don't get it, you selfish SOB. He said, we were here just in case. We're here to carry the message. We are responsible for the effort, not the outcome. And you know what? I met him after work that night. We had dinner. So we spent a total of maybe four, four and a half hours together. I got home. I still was able to catch the fourth quarter, you know. But the deal was, you know what? That's what we're supposed to do. I am responsible. When anyone anywhere reaches out for help, I want the hand of the aid to always be there. And for that, I'm responsible. I can't worry about anyone else. Because you know why? Because there were old timers there for me, you know, who put up with all my lies and crazy behavior and everything else. And they sat patiently and never, they never kicked me out of Alcoholics Anonymous. They just said, please keep coming back, kid. You know, I, uh, I was in Mexico in 1993. I thought I could speak Spanish. Those poor people are probably still figuring out what the hell I said. <laughs> I was the only English-speaking person in a Spanish-speaking meeting. And my Spanish, since I worked in North Philadelphia, consisted of Dame Pistola, which is give me your gun. <laughs> so so I'm, I'm speaking. I thought I could speak Spanish. And those, they, I could tell by their look that, that they didn't understand. So I switched over to English. And you know what? They still didn't understand. But you know what? At the end of the meeting, they came up and they, they hugged me. And I could tell who the old-timer was by the surrender in their face. And I can tell who the new guy was by the, by the pain in the face. You know what? They didn't understand, but you know what? They understood. Language of the heart. Incredible experience, you know? When I talk about when I had aspirations to be the delegate, you know, go through, you got to go through the process with DCM and area officer. Uh, I had one of those positions. And in 1993, I got diagnosed with lung cancer. And it was a pretty fluke way that I, I found out. I was training to run a marathon. I went to run Boston. You need to do a qualifying marathon to do that. And I was training for the Marine Corps Marathon. And, and I wound up getting, uh, something was going on. So I went to get a second opinion after it got confirmed. And, and it was a confirmed lung cancer. I never smoked in my life. A little reefer for a short period of time, but I never smoked a cigarette. No big deal, right? And I remember when I came home, I, I was stunned, you know. And you come sober for a, while, uh, for a while. I'm doing the deal. I got things happening. And uh, I, I, I didn't handle this well. And I remember my sponsor at the time. He said, Bobby, so what are you going to do about this? And I went through, the, you know, the chemo and then I... Uh, radiation, and uh, I, I bounced back and did pretty good, and then, and then I got sick again. It came back fairly quickly, and they had to get aggressive, and they wound up having to remove um, the lower left lobe of my lung, you know, and I, I really got sick there for a bit, and I finally had to give up my position, and you know, because I wanted to hold on to it out of ego, but the deal was I just couldn't do the job, you know, and I knew that the area would be better served if someone else took the position, and I gave it up uh, reluctantly, but I knew it was the best thing to do. But then I was laid up in my house. I always, I always made meetings, but I couldn't even make meetings anymore because I was very sick. And people start coming to my house to carry the meeting, carry the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm just not talking about people I knew, like from my home group or from a neighborhood. I'm talking about people that I met maybe once or twice at the assembly. You know, you're looking at a liar, thief, and a cheat. I took from everyone. The only thing I gave was heartache and misery. And they came to carry the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, I'm a firm believer that my doctors did a pretty good job, but it was definitely the prayers and alcoholics that helped me, you know. And I bounced back. I was doing good. I was like one month shy of five years. I had been complete remission. I got sick again. And I just finished up treatment. Uh, it was uh, like 15 months ago since I had last, my last treatment. You know, my hair grew back, and now like, I get in a little belly. I never had one of them, and I glow in the dark. But other than that, I'm doing pretty good, <laughs> you know. I, I'm doing pretty good, you know. I thought maybe I had an excuse to go out and get loaded, but you know what? I really didn't have a reason to go out and get loaded. I had a pretty good life. And because I practiced these principles very reluctantly, but just the same, you know what? I got to embrace life. There's a lot of things I've done in my past that if I could change in a heartbeat, I could. And I'm not even talking about drinking. I'm talking about sober. I did some, some things I'm not proud of. But I can't change it, you know. But you know what? As I went through the steps, not only did the obsession to drink was removed from me, which is a miracle, but most importantly... My past. I can't change my past, but the steps enable me to change my attitude about my past. And my past is no longer the albatross that it was. You know, I have a lot of rewards, and, and none of them are financial. It's the intangibles you can't put a price on. I'm talking about true friendship, you know, peace of mind. You know, it, it's just a wonderful way of life, you know. I love Alcoholics Anonymous. One of my favorite sayings is, we absolutely insist on enjoying life. If the newcomer could see no joy in our existence, they wouldn't want nothing to do with us. And obviously, I just paraphrase that last sentence. Bill Wilson's much more eloquent than I am. But you catch the deal, you know. And, and I put this out for the new guy. Because if you're here tonight and you think, oh, my Christ, my life is over. I've got to wear the hair shirt. got to beat myself. Man, you're greatly mistaken. Your life is just starting. 
whatever you did drunk, you can do stone cold sober. And you can be better at it. You can have more fun, and most of all, you can remember it. It's a blast. <laughs> I alluded a couple times, I mentioned the passing, now I am a mummer. Third generation mummer, as a matter of fact, you know. Now, I know quite a few of you guys are from the area, but there may be a few people here. I don't know if Irene knows what a mummer is, uh, so I'll tell her, and for the benefit of others. Mummers is uh, it's a parade that's been going on in Philadelphia for hundreds of years, you know. Uh, and in 1901, the city finally had to organize the mayhem because it was getting nuts. What it is, it's a bunch of men in sequins, feathers, and makeup, and we <laughs> dance and play mis- instruments in the middle of the street. Now, I've done a fist step. I'm free. I, you know, it doesn't matter. <laughs> in fact, you know what? There was a, um, a documentary came out about a year ago called Strut, and uh, there was a guy in there, and he said, uh, he said, you're not a man until you go on up Broad Street in heels. It's a great night. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, it's a great time. What it is, it, it's like a cross between the Mardi Gras and the full Monty. It's a blast. <laughs> I tell people, I think we make the Mardi Gras look like a bunch of Mormons. And, uh, yeah. and it's on New Year's Day, and it's bitter cold, and there's drinking, and there's, you know. It's, to be honest, it's the only day of the year that I, in Philadelphia, where people get along. You know, seriously. You know, whatever neighborhood you're from, black or white, for some reason, I mean, they say the city of brotherly love. That's definitely a misnomer. But on New Year's Day, on New Year's Day, we do get along. And I just think that's cool. And, uh, but uh, it's a drunk fest. So 13 years ago, I'm at the Stepping Stones, a midnight meeting, telling my story. I'm a lifelong mummer. I'm sober a couple years at this point. I have not marched in the two previous parades because I'm sober. A kid came up to me afterwards. He said, Bobby, would you be interested in marching the parade this year? I said, man, you're out of your mind. People are placing the things. I got no business being there. He said, you don't understand. He said, we're starting a group of sober mummers called the 12 Steppers. <laughs> now, sober mummers, that's definitely an oxymoron. <laughs> So, 12 years ago, this past, this past New Year's, was our 12th year up the street as the 12 Steppers New Year's Brigade. <laughs> For me, it was my 34th parade. Here I am, able to do something that was a big part of my family. I'm able to do it sober. Now, obviously, when we get to City Hall, we do a head count to make sure no one got pulled in the crowd at brought time. <laughs> But the reason I put, and in 1999, our brigade came in first place. It, it, it was a blast. So if you can do the strut on New Year's Day sober, anything is possible. <laughs> you know, I, uh, this is uh, put on by the area. That service, uh, service is important. I want to close with this. The 12th step takes many different forms and fashions, you know. I am a firm believer that every person in this room has a gift. It may be different than the person next to you, but it's your gift. You know, I did corrections for a while, and I know corrections aren't for everyone for any number of reasons. But there's other types of work you can do. There's treatment facilities committee. There's, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's corrections. There's a telephone volunteer. There's a CPC. Uh, that's CPC, not PCP. CPC. <laughs> Cooperation with professional community. You take people to open meetings, you know, uh, professional students. Uh, you can get involved in the inner group or the area if you have time. Some people can just stay home to answer phones. Uh, putting this conference on as a 12-step event, you know. Some guys make great coffee. Some people work with newcomers behind the scenes. Some people are real good organizers, and some people are good with checkbooks. And there are some people who probably should never, ever be in the your checkbook, but you know what the deal is. <laughs> and I'm a firm believer. Like I said, you just got to find out what your gift is. It, it's a wonderful way of life. If you're new, please get a home group, get a sponsor, get involved. It, it's the whole bowl of wax. It's just not one thing. I knew people who did certain things, and they went out and get loaded. But you know what? I don't want you to think that recovery is like a lottery and one day it spins on you and it's your day to drink. That's not true. It does not work that way. You know, I've known people who've done the deal day in, day out, you know, and all I have is a daily reprieve contingent on my spiritual maintenance. I'm not drunk proof, but you know what? I got a pretty good shot. I'm not picking up a drink if I follow the directions that have been in, laid uh, in front of me by the new com- uh, by the old timers, you know. So if you're new, please keep coming back. It's a wonderful way of life. And I thank you for the privilege of participating in an AA meeting. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.